Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, online book launch for LSE Ideas. I'm quite delighted to see a very high participant number here and really pleased to welcome you all to this talk. I should probably introduce myself. Um, Dr. Aaron McKeel from LSE Ideas, a course tutor, course convener on the Executive Master's Program in International Strategy and Diplomacy. Um, we're starting on time and hopefully we'll finish on time in an hour and 10 minutes time. Um, I'm very pleased to, to introduce and host this talk from uh, Professor Christopher Coker, um, the co-director of LSE Ideas, um, lecturer and professor at the LSE International Relations Department for 40 years or more, um, and the author of numerous books, over 20. Um, I think the count is 23 books at the moment, uh, with the latest, which we will discuss this evening. Um, uh, Professor Coger has remarks prepared, and then we'll engage in Q&A. Um, um, please uh, use the, the chat function, which you might be familiar with at this point, and I'll gather questions as best I can at the appropriate time. All right, so thank you everyone for joining us. Christopher, over to you. Unmute Christopher, please. Okay, there we are. I think now everything is uh, fine. Um, at the end of 2018, uh, just a few months before the pandemic, I was reading a very well received book by the Harvard professor Stephen Pinker called Enlightenment Now. And one claim caught my eye on that occasion. Uh, that thanks to the wonders of medical science, we would never again witness another pandemic. Another claim in his book was that we were also going out of the war business. And I think the present pandemic is a forceful reminder of not, uh, to use military metaphor, not jumping the gun and thinking that we've uh, made it out uh, of the past into a bright and wonderful future. We are told by many epidemiologists that pandemics of which this was the first in the 21st century. We're going to see many more this century, just as the last century was the century of revolution and the century of total war. I suspect also the 21st century will also be a century of war too. And that's what I'm here this afternoon to talk about. I wrote this book because my students are often told that war is a pathology, which is rather like a disease or a virus, uh, that it's, it's fatal for the host. Um, it's not necessarily the case. Uh, I think war has adaptive value, just as many other things that we find rather disagreeable have adaptive value. Anger, for example, which certainly is annoying, especially when directed against oneself. But we're told by psychologists that anger has a very positive uh, function as well. It blunts feelings of helplessness and insecurity. And when it's directed against an outsider, from your particular group, it can actually solidify the group. And there have been many historians who've argued that war has had an adaptive value for the last uh, several thousand years. One is Ian Morris in his rather provocatively titled book, War, What Is It Good For? Who argues that thanks to war, we live lives that are 20 times safer than they were back in the Stone Age. Another is the Stanford historian, Walter Scheidel, uh, who had a book out last year, arguing that there hasn't been a single advance in technology and finance or in political organization in Europe until very recently, uh, that hasn't been the result of, of persistent interstate war on the European continent. And an another quite recent book by Perea uh, uh, Satya argues that uh, Britain got the Industrial Revolution first, thanks to its undisguised militarism, that we were at war most of the time. Indeed, uh, this country, my country, has invaded, occupied, or passed through uninvited all but 13 members of the United Nations. And that's a record that will never be equaled or certainly not surpassed. So there is an adaptive value to war. What most historians would agree is that it has lost much of its value because the consequences and the outcomes are now global and uh, so dangerous. But just let's get back to the evolutionary point of view. Um, we are one of 70 species, 
or they go in for intraspecific violence. That's a technical term for uh, attacking members of our own species. But of those 70 species, we're the only ones that go to war. The higher primates, chimpanzees, our nearest cousins, of course, do not do war, they do coalition violence. There's a very big difference between the two. Arguably, ants have been in the war business, of course, millions of years before ourselves. They predated us and they will almost certainly outlive us. But I think it's very difficult to apply the term war as we understand it. Ultimately, we are at the top of the food chain, unfortunately, because of war. We are the hyper predators on this planet. And if you want to know what a hyper predator looks like, there's no need to rent out a DVD of the movie Jaws. Just go and have a look at yourself in the mirror before you go to bed tonight. You are a hyper predator. We are all hyper predators. And what I set out to do in this book is to explain the evolutionary origins of war and to explain via this uh, discussion why we are still going to remain in the war business for the foreseeable future with very little prospect of ever going out of it. It's part of our humanity. And I took uh, as, my, as my method what's called the Tinbergen method, named after a Nobel winning ethologist called Nico Tinbergen, who won the Nobel Prize in 1973 for his work in e ethology, in the field of ethology. And Tinbergen said this, that if you want to understand any human behavior, you could take marriage, for example, which is also, I would, uh, uh, I would suggest, probably more obviously unique to one species ourselves. Or in this case, of course, you can take war, which I also believe to be unique to one species ourselves. And you have to ask yourself four questions to understand why we engage in this activity. The first is, what are its biological origins? What's its origins in deep time, in deep history? The second is what are the cultural mechanisms which fuel it, which keep it going? The third is what is its history? How has it changed and evolved over time? And finally, its function. And what he meant by function was how does it tap into our humanity, into what makes us human? Now, humanity is a word, of course, that we apply not only to describe a particular species, our own, but also the behavior that we think is unique to it or the qualities or indeed the vices uh, that it might embody. So if I can run through the list uh, very quickly in the time that I have, let's just start with the first question, what are its origins? And there are many uh, things I looked at, such as the fact that we have language and that we use tools, and those tools have been turned into weapons at a very early stage. But the two that I want to highlight this afternoon are that we're tribal. We are intensely tribal. We identify the social groups the membership of which makes us feel safe. Uh, the safest uh, social group is the family. Uh, the next uh, is a kinship group. The next is a tribe. Uh, and of course, for us, for everyone beaming in to listen to this talk today, the biggest tribe that we've ever invented, which is called a nation state. We derive our identity still from the nation. We are intensely territorial. And what I think is surprising, perhaps, in the 21st century, or would have surprised people at the beginning of the 20th who looked forward to a greater era of humanity, is that it is the contingent factors of our existence, such as class or race or nationality, that figure most prominently in our minds. We have enormous difficulty talking ourselves as being human. We have enormous difficulty in seeing what universally we share with other human beings. And that's one explanation, by the way, I and mean, you shouldn't be surprised why nationalism is on the increase uh, right across the world in Europe, of course, but also uh, outside in Asia as well. Another factor I would take into account is hunting. We hunted to death the mega fauna of, uh, 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 for, uh, sorry, of Australia 20,000 years ago. Uh, kangaroos that were carnivorous, tortoises that were as large as small cars, all went in a very, very fast uh, time. 10,000 years later, we exterminated uh, the, the larger animals of North America. We hunted to death species that posed a threat to us. And then we turned our weapons on ourselves because we could. And the Greek philosopher Aristotle described hunting uh, as, uh, described war as the hunting of people and possessions together. 
He said of the hunting of possessions that it's looting, and he said of the hunting of people, we call it slavery. But he said when you combine the two, you get war. And the Greeks were not very squeamish when it comes to definitions. So when we look back on the war on terror and the archetypal weapon that we use, which is the drone, we're in the era of drone warfare, it's not surprising that Donald Rumsfeld, the uh, American Defense Secretary, uh, back in 2001 asked a few days after the Pentagon had been attacked, he asked his staff, how do we organize the Defense Department for manhunts? And that basically is what drone technology is designed to do, to profile certain individuals, to hunt them down, uh, as we have been hunting down other species and ourselves for a very, very long time. Which, of course, is one explanation for why the International Committee of the Red Cross and others are horrified by the thought that one day those drones may be autonomous or semi-autonomous, able to target at their own discretion without programming from ourselves. Killer robots, the campaign to stop killer robots is uh, gaining momentum. And there's a reason why the Terminator franchise, for those of you who've seen the Terminator movies uh, in the cinema, does so well at the box office, because I th think it taps into our ultimate fear that one day we may no longer be, thanks to hunting, at the top of the food chain. Uh, it threatens our most important human right that uh, we have a right to be killed only by a member of our own species. I will come to robots uh, at the very end of this talk. Let me move on now to uh, cultural mechanisms, the things that fuel war. What's the cultural mechanism? I think the one way of looking at it is a performance enhancing drug. So if you take the Olympics and you take people who run the 800 meters, some of them will cheat, some of them will be on performance enhancing drugs, which may or may not be detected. Some, of course, are illegal. But although athletes, uh, some athletes take them, it's not the reason they are running the race. They are running the race to gain a reputation, to win a reputation, to write themselves into the record books so that we can tell stories about them. And that's the most important thing that we do. We are a storytelling species. Again, this makes us unique as a species on this planet. Uh, storytelling fuels war because it provides archetypal heroes that we want to emulate. It creates uh, wonderful narratives around which nations uh, congregate uh, the national myths and mythologies that animate nationalism. We've been telling ourselves stories, of course, since we first uh, sat about around a campfire uh, in our hunter-gatherer days. That's 95% of our of our existence uh, historically. And there's a good scientific explanation for why storytelling works so well. Uh, three chemicals are released into the brain when we tell each other stories or when we listen to stories, I should say. One is cortisol, which assists in memory formation and embeds the stories uh, deeply in our uh, minds. Uh, the second is dopamine, which regulates our emotional response to the stories we are being told. That explains, by the way, why we always want to get to the end of a detective novel to find out who the murderer is. It explains why when we're looking at miniseries, we hate cliffhangers. We hate having to wait the next week to find out what happened to the character concerned. And then thirdly, there's a chemical called oxytocin, which is associated with empathy. So we not only empathize with our heroes, fictional or not, some of us daydream we want to become them. That is the importance of storytelling. And we have been telling uh, one story in the Western world for 2,600 years, the story of the Trojan War embodied in Homer's great epic, the Iliad. There have been 11 translations of the Iliad into English uh, this century, since 2000. It's still going strong. Uh, the American poet Robert Fagels came to West Point in 2009 to read out passages from his translation of the Iliad to the young cadets in the college, some of whom two years later found themselves in Afghanistan taking part in a military operation that was named Operation Achilles. So when we think uh, of cultural mechanisms fueling war, we should think of literature, uh, we should think of film, and we should think of history. Why do we read history? It is to honor our ancestors, and honoring the ancestors is one of the most important human 
uh, characteristics, which distinguishes all people uh, across age and across culture. So take a film that was very popular after 9-11. You may have seen it, the film 300, which told the story of the defense of Thermopylae, the pass at Thermopylae by 300 uh, Spartans who held at bay thousands of Persians in the war between the two. Um, the film struck a chord for a reason. It came out after 9-11. It was seen to tell a story not dissimilar from that which the Greek historian Herodotus had told, from which, of course, we gain our knowledge of the Greek-Persian wars. Or think of the way to bring it up to date in Russia today. The greatest event in 900 years of Russian history is now considered to be the Great Patriotic War between 1941 and 1945, the greatest war in human history in which 27 million Russians lost their lives. This is considered to be part of an endless story of the struggle between Russia and the West, the nasty peoples who came from the Western world uh, into Russian history. It's a heroic version of history. It's a redacted version of history. It, it is a, it's a very singular version of history, but we want history to be heroic. It was the American philosopher William James who said it is we human beings who insist on making history a theater of heroism. But don't worry about Greek epic poems or, 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 or literature or the novels like uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace. Think of the visual because this is how we teach and, uh, stories now. It's what we watch on screens that is so much more important, certainly for the students that I used to teach when I was in the uh, International Relations Department at LSE, or think of the video games that they play. The very first British uh, ISIS uh, bomber, suicide bomber, who blew himself up in Baghdad in 2009, left a message for his family saying that he'd been spending months playing Call of Duty, and now he was going off to Syria to do it for real. Uh, video games, Oh, 50 percent of them are about conflict of one form or another. People are playing war games at home from a very, very early age. And of course, the great thing about video games is they make war highly entertaining. And they do this by screening out, of course, the atrocities or the trauma, physical or mental. They don't recreate those in the games. Um, they produce uh, war as a battlefield, as a, as a box, a kill box in which there are no civilians. So you don't need to feel too bad about that. And fighting is reduced basically to a set of, of body counts. And this is going to become even more, I think, interesting when we move into the world of immersive virtual reality, when in fact it will be very difficult to tell the difference between what's on the screen and what's out there in the real world. I just mentioned two uh, games which I think are important, Second Life, uh, which allows you to inhabit an alternative reality uh, you can become a billionaire uh, in Second Life if you're lucky. A few years ago, the programmers of that game were surprised to find that a terrorist movement had suddenly emerged. It wasn't meant to be part of the program. There was no terrorism in Second Life as far as the programmers were concerned, but we human beings, of course, will invent terrorism if we possibly can, and we did. Uh, it was a terrorist movement that was aimed at globalization, and which targeted uh, companies like Nissan, which believe it or not, launched one of its car models in Second Life so you could drive it before it actually appeared in the showrooms, before you could actually buy it. And then the other one I would mention is the World of Warcraft, which uh, a few years ago was the most popular game ever. Uh, the, the game uh, program has introduced a new character called a, a, a winged serpent, um, which gave you the plague if you uh, were bitten by it. But what was fascinating is that a number of people deliberately got themselves infected so that they could go through a portal in time and die, but before dying, infect the enemy community. And that is why the Department of Homeland Security, watching the people playing this game, actually knocked on people's doors and said, what makes you want to become a martyr for your own cause? What makes you want to become a suicide bomber, basically? So that is the importance of cultural mechanisms, and they are replicating war 
as they always have replicated war since the days of the great epic poems, whether we're talking about the Indian epics, Chinese epics, or the, the Greek epics. Let me turn now to the third element, uh, be brief on this respect because it's so self-evident, history. We're the only species, again, that has history. Um, every other species has a life, but only we have a history. Uh, and in the case of war, it, of course, it is evolved uh, from the time that we emerged from our hunter-gatherer state of existence to the states that we live in now, our cosmopolitan globalized communities, but also in terms of technology from the Stone Age right through to the Age of Steel and, of course, the Digital Age today. And it is the capacity of war to adapt, to change, to be useful that makes it so resilient. Uh, another uh, human activity, by the way, which is equally resilient, is slavery. And fascinatingly, according to the United Nations, in terms of absolute numbers, there are more slaves in the world today than ever before in human history. We don't actually have slave markets as we did in the days of the Middle Passage and the slave trade across the Atlantic, although ISIS had slave markets, by the way, in its caliphate, but we traffic people. It's another kind of slavery, or we sell children on for periods of their time as bond labor in South Asia and elsewhere. And when it comes to states, well, I think China and the United States are already on a collision course uh, for a major conflict between themselves, 50-50 chance that they can actually avoid a war. But where will this war be fought? And of course, it will not be fought like the Second World War. It will be fought in space. It will be fought in uh, cyberspace. Um, and uh, it may be fought in uh, areas like information warfare, uh, etc. War survives because it is intensely adaptable. And just to take cyber warfare, which is the thing that should make us, I think, more worried than anything else, there are at least 30 billion interconnected, uh, internet connected devices in the world today, 30 billion, from uh, smartphones to biometric sensors to surveillance systems, 130 new devices get added every second of the day. This creates a degree of vulnerability that we have never seen before in human history in terms of communication chains. Same goes uh, for servers, which uh, power cloud computing, where so much of our data is stored. So the prospect of a war in cyberspace should be deeply disturbing indeed, but that is the space in which probably the great powers will choose to engage, in which terrorists will certainly choose to engage. Um, in the future, which brings me to non-state actors, self-serving groups, uh, self, not self-serving, sorry, uh, self-starting groups like ISIS. It's fascinating how a new kind of terrorist organization has emerged or, or take a movement like Anonymous. Some of you may even be members of Anonymous. The point is you wouldn't know whether you are members of Anonymous. Described by Time magazine a couple of years ago as person of the year. Time magazine always has on its cover a person of the year, except Anonymous isn't a person. It's not an institution. It's not a movement. It's not an organization. It's an opt-in and opt-out happening, if to use a 1960s term. Um, and it's the kind of organization that we can expect to do war in the future. And finally, the environment, because climate change, of course, is uppermost in our minds. And we may well say, well, isn't that the key challenge that we all face if we are to survive the 21st century, or at least uh, even the first half of the 21st century. But you see, the environment has powered war. Uh, climate change has been a permanent feature of the changing character of war from the very beginning. Um, uh, whether you're going back to the Huns who lost their pasture land and were forced to migrate thousands of miles across the great steppes of Asia into the Western Roman Empire and almost destroyed the Western Roman Empire in a matter of four or five years, or whether you're looking at the Little Ice Age between the 16th and 19th centuries where uh, the climate was uh, one degree centigrade colder than the average in the 20th century, which created enormous amount of human stress, which forced people into wars and which were wars that were particularly monstrous because they were almost entirely about survival. We will see wars of climate change in the course of the next 20 or 30 years.
In fact, Robert Cooper, uh, the, uh, who used to work with uh, Xavier Solana in the European Union, called uh, the uh, war in Darfur the first war of global climate change. I would say that the civil war in Syria, which is the most lethal war that we've seen in recent years, is actually the first war of climate change. It followed a four-year drought, um, which was unique in the country's history. Anyway, that just shows you how history continues to power this phenomenon that we call war. It encourages people to think in those terms, in terms of those options. So let me finally move to the fourth element in Tinbergen's method, functions. How does it tap into our society? I would say that war does this because it is highly contagious. Uh, and like a virus, it can infect young, impressionable minds. It can encourage you to want to die for your country. It can encourage you to want to martyr yourself for your faith. That is one very important point. Our need to lead lives that are meaningful for other people. Our need to serve others, our need to derive self-esteem from what we do for other people. We are not an inherently selfish group. We are an inherently sociable group that is willing from time to time to sacrifice ourselves for others, to make sacrifices for others. Unfortunately, also to sacrifice others. The two are not mutually exclusive. There's a second point about war that I think the philosopher Hegel understood very well in the early 19th century when he said war would only come to an end when warriors no longer needed it. There are natural warriors, people who feel more alive in war than they could ever feel in civilian life. And that was brought home to me when I read a remarkable book by uh, the American journalist uh, Sebastian Younger about his time as an embedded journalist in 2009 uh, in the Korangal Valley in Afghanistan, where he made a lot of friendships with the, the soldiers with whom uh, he, he served. Months after returning to New York, while he was writing this book, he met up with one of the young men he'd got to know very well, one of the walking wounded, uh, a fellow who was clearly suffering from burnout, both mental and physical, uh, subject to wild mood swings, in other words, traumatized, suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. And they would go on for long drinking sessions. And one day, uh, this young man told uh, Younger that when soldiers drink themselves into oblivion, it is not always to forget the bad stuff, the horrors they've seen. It's more complicated than that, he said. We drink because we miss the good stuff. The world that we have returned to, the civilian world, is less alive for us, is less meaningful for us than the world that we came from. A world in which trust is at a premium, in which soldiers trust each other, and that element of trust you'll never find in civilian relationships. So what I'm claiming is what the American psychologist Abraham Maslow discovered in 1943, when he drew up a, a hierarchy of human needs. And he said there were four things that human beings need to be human, to celebrate or realize their humanity. Uh, three of them are very obvious. One is security. We need, of course, to secure ourselves against dangers and threats. One is food. We need to survive on a day-by-day -day basis. And one is sex, uh, either for recreation or for procreation. But the fourth, and this was relatively novel when he made this claim in 1943, was self-actualization. The need to live what for us is a meaningful life. So if you ever ask yourself why young uh, men, mostly men, but also women, are willing to blow themselves and others up, of course, as jihadists uh, in, a, in the fight for the faith against the, the unfaithful, well, that may be simply because it's the need to live a meaningful life. Um, we don't know why people really become suicide bombers. Uh, any more than we understand why people become serial killers. It's interesting to know that not one FBI profiling unit at the FBI headquarters in Quantico, Virginia, 
has ever instigated the arrest of a serial killer. Every serial killer in the United States has usually been caught by accident or by chance, and only after their interrogation by the police are they discovered to fit the profile that the profilers had produced of the likely person the police were looking for. I think the same is true of jihadists. They come from rich countries and poor countries. They come from democracies and they come from autocracies. They come from every country and region of the world, with the exception perhaps of Antarctica. What motivates them, we still don't entirely know. Some would say boredom. I think that's very important, which uh, includes uh, the need to free yourself from a whole range of uh, of disorders like frustration and, and resentment. Um, but another is simply the need to escape into a group, to become a member of a group. And there's a book called Talking to the Enemy by Peter Tooley, who insists that basically jihadists go in for what uh, academics call identity fusion. That is the need to belong to a group. War attracts, uh, I make two other points, war attracts some very bad people, because it provides opportunities for you to do very bad things, sometimes without retribution or without punishment. So we should always remember what the philosopher Nietzsche called the sportive monsters who lurk out there. But war also forces good people or turns good people into bad people. Uh, it produces psychic deterioration, the breakdown of discipline, etc. Now, all of these uh, factors are going to persist into the future. And I'm going to end on this note, uh, as I did in my book, because yes, we are changing. We've entered what is called a post-human age. What the post-human age means is that our humanity is biologically and culturally changing. Our cultural and biological DNA is going to be different. We're incorporating machinery into our bodies. We're becoming cyborgs. I understand that uh, most people can only be separated from their iPhone during the day for seven minutes before they start getting very concerned and very worried. This is the world that we're in, the post-human stage. And some of you will, of course, be aware that we are introducing robots uh, onto the battlefield. 5,000 of them served in Iraq with the American forces uh, at the height of the uh, insurgency and counterinsurgency. And some of those robots will be taking decisions for us in the years ahead. Does that mean war will be any less human an activity? And the answer is no. So I shall end just on, on that note. And I want to suggest that we should look very carefully at um, the functions that a war will perform if we're worried about whether it will continue to be a human activity or what the Greek military historian Thucydides called it uh, in Attic Greek to Anthropon, which means in translation, the human thing, which was the only definition he was willing to make. War is the human thing. Doesn't sound great, does it? It might portray in your minds a kind of poverty of imagination. You couldn't come up with something more entertaining or interesting than the human thing. But to call something a thing is actually to acknowledge its inherent complexity. And it's to refuse to define it because it's in a sense indefinable. What would a war without human emotion look like? And I offer you two fictional examples for your consideration. The first is a short story by the American author Don DeLillo called Human Moments in World War III, in which our hero, a young guy called Volmer, sits at a uh, control console in an orbiting space station, basically surveying the world for terrorists and zapping them whenever they can be found. There are a few human moments in this war, ironically, uh, because Delilo is being ironic, such as the fact that Volna can wear his carpet slippers when he's uh, sitting at his control console. He can listen to music, which is being piped. And at one point, Volna tells his commanding officer he likes his job, he's happy, and he's reprimanded by his officer. Happiness, he's told, is not one of the mission parameters. Now, happiness 
and unhappiness both are to be found in war. War does make some people happy, but just imagine a world in which happiness is not a mission parameter. Then you will have had to find something very different from the wars that we fought in the past. But I shall conclude on another note of fiction, uh, Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, a novel by Douglas Adams, the man who, of course, is more famous for writing The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And in this world, which is set in the 21st century, there's a robot for every human task, uh, a robot that will spare you from the need for effort or work or labor, anything um, that uh, detracts from your wonderful world of leisure. You're even spared from the need to have convictions. There is a robot called an electric monk that will believe in God for you. And that, I think, is the real nightmare that should keep you perhaps awake at night. A future in which you can fight wars with a good conscience, because you don't have to think about them at all. Other people will be thinking for you. An article appeared in the magazine Wired about 12 years ago with a very provocative title, Does the Future Still Need Us? I could write an article, I suppose, with an equally provocative title, does war still need us? It's an apposite question. But the fact that war might not need us doesn't mean we will see the end of war. It just means that we may one day see the end of what makes war so definingly and definitively human. And I will end on that note, Aaron, if I may, and look forward to accusations and questions and anything else you would like in a very aggressive way to throw at me. Terrific. Thank you. That was a terrific summary of, of, a, of a book that covers an enormous amount of history and a, an enormous question as well, with a method you had for your answer as well. Nicely organized. We have uh, at least a dozen questions. Um, I have one question to start of my own. One seems to be the origin of the question of the book. It, and why war seems to be, is this a modern hang up? Is this the idea that our international orders are insufficient and that the outlawry of war is a vexed ambition? Is, is this just a distinctly modern book or is this something, are you saying perhaps that the modern ideas should recognize our, our enduring uh, human realities? There's something, what about the origins of the big book, the, the invention of peace and, and the endurance of war is my general question to start. Well, the very uh, renowned military historian, Michael Howard wrote a book, I think indeed it was his last book, if not his last, it was one of his very last, called um, The uh, Invention of Peace. Um, war was not invented. Peace was invented. The idea of peace was invented. That's the point that he was making in his book. Uh, my own uh, argument would be that war has been taken for granted so much because it's what human beings have done that until 300 years ago, no one actually asked the question, why war? Any more than they asked the question, why slavery? Uh, slavery is as almost as old as war. Indeed, war and slavery are joined at the hip. Frequently, people went to war for human labor because that was the main energy source that they had before fossil fuels. And one of the few people ever to write a book in justification of slavery was Aristotle. Uh, that, I think, in itself is an extraordinary departure that Aristotle thought it necessary to write a book about slavery because nobody else did, as far as we know. And the first person I know who questioned war, other than the Christian pieties about the brotherhood of man and everybody should get on with each other, etc., was Erasmus in the 16th century, about whom Michael Howard also wrote a book, a uh, famous book called War and the Liberal Conscience, saying a liberal conscience against war starts really in the 16th century with people like Erasmus. But it takes off in the 18th century with the idea of trade. It takes off with the idea that in fact, cooperation and not conflict 
is the main source of human progress. And then a hundred years later, we were told by Darwin exactly the same message, which social Darwinists, of course, completely misunderstood. Darwin makes it quite clear that it is not conflict that powers uh, history, it is cooperation. But you can't, of course, have one without the other. And everything that enables you to put together a coalition to work towards a good, positive aim enables you to put together a coalition aimed against other people or to get rich quick or to take shortcuts uh, in history by being nastier rather than nice. I think war has become problematic for liberals in the last 250 years and we have told ourselves that it is possible to disinvent it, whether it's the Kellogg-Briand Pact in the 1920s where you could actually declare that you had disinvented war, or whether you find all sorts of conflict mechanisms and the whole subject of conflict resolution to reduce incentives for war, the need for war, to go out of the war business that way. Um, my book is to trying to explain why that endeavor will continue, but why it's likely to be no more successful than it has been um, since the days of the League of Nations. Uh, and of course, the UN. That's a really helpful answer. Uh, it speaks to a lot of the questions that we have, I think. A lot of the questions concern, what about this factor or the other factor, which mm. most of them speak to a lot of the deeper themes about, about war and peace. Um, one question, for instance, is about resource distribution. Not only the problem of scarcity, um, but the, the idea that inequality as a source of war, what about that? And another question, if I can put some together, would be what about, uh, I think it was a question about the solving the economic depression, which I think would speak to the idea of the war profiteers and the idea that war is good for the economy. What about, what about those two things? Resource distribution, e inequality as a source of war, and, and uh, the idea that war is a, as a solution to economic depression. These questions. Well, war for some countries was very useful for the economy. Um, and if you're looking at uh, colonialism, which was gaining real estate uh, through conflict between the colonial powers or just seizing territory, of course, for those who were already inhabiting it, uh, war was the, the mechanism. And you then, of course, came up with a economic models like neo mercantilism which told you that uh, the economy was basically zero sum so you could only grow wealthy at the expense of someone else and it was this zero sum mentality uh war was of course the, the way in which you made yourself rich and others poor i think in the 20th century only one country made itself rich through war and that was the united states uh that emerged from the great depression fully thanks to mobilization of the economy during the Second World War, full employment, etc. cetera. Um, and, that, um, and then found itself becoming progressively poorer as a result of wars. First of all, printing the dollar to pay for the, the Vietnam War, uh, which led to um, uh, rapid inflation, uh, inflationary cycles, which were a factor of the 70s and, and, and other periods. Um, and then of course, charged people for the first Gulf War. You may recall that Saudi Arabia uh, paid for uh, American help in the first and, and, and Japan raised a special tax uh, to pay for America's services. Um, and then of course, in the second Gulf War and more recently uh, has not done well out of war. war. War does not really make a profit for you in the old fashioned sense of the term. Um, but my argument would be that economics has never stopped people from going to war because that's not the reason people go to war. People go to war for honor, which is called credibility. Uh, to maintain your credibility it required the United States to spend three and a half trillion dollars after 9-11 to get its credibility back. Not that I think its credibility really was on the line, but many people thought it was. For fear, people are fearful, particularly when they think they're in decline. Uh, they think they're about to be overtaken by another great power. It's called the Thucydidean trap, going back to the work of Thucydides. Um, and uh, yes, resources, uh, and we will see resource wars uh, in the future. You could say, as many critics of America have said, most of America's wars in the Middle East have been oil wars. I think that is, in fact, 
uh, not necessarily the case, but I do think we will be struggling for resources uh, in the future as they uh, begin to dry up and uh, become more difficult to find. So that's the economic uh, argument there. Um, inequality, uh, yes, uh, ma massive inequalities. Uh, that leads more, I think, to civil war and conflicts and goes back again to Greek thinkers and Aristotle, the, the first Greek thinkers to talk about the difference between the haves and the have nots. That politics is has always been about social conflicts between those who have and those who have not, uh, or perhaps in the future, those who have not yet got it. And that may be a, a different uh, categorization. So the economic ar argument is important, but when I read in The Economist last week, uh, you may have seen the, the cover, the most dangerous place in the world, it's uh, Taiwan. It's about the very real possibility of a conventional conflict between the United States and China saying that, of course, because Taiwan is responsible for 80% of the semiconductor industry in the world, uh, a war between those two countries would be catastrophic for all of us. Uh, absolutely. But you could have said the same in 1914 about a war between Germany and England, who were each other's largest trading partners, and that didn't prevent them from going to war against each other. And the semiconductor industry is not going to prevent China and the United States from going to war against each other if the circumstances present themselves in a particular way. One uh, question I have here in the chat from participant under the, the name of Michael Mann uh, asks, how do you account for the fact that the vast majority of human beings do not make war? Surely I, I don't, and most people in their everyday lives don't. Um, you spoke about certain characters that enjoy war perhaps, or find themselves embroiled in it. But what about everyone else? I guess is the type of the question there. How many of us do politics? How many of us have ever met a politician in our lives? Um, how many of us uh, are political agents or political actors? We go along with the, the mainstream. We either vote as we've been doing today uh, in the UK. Uh, in local elections or a couple of by-elections that are coming along. Uh, we, we devolve responsibility to politicians. Um, we live in what uh, is famously called an imagined community because in that community that we call the nation state, we, how many people do we ever meet from that nation state? We're willing to go to war for that nation state. We were willing to be conscripted for that nation state. Nation states no longer conscript their citizens because war has moved beyond that uh, age of total war and mobilization uh, into a, a different age that doesn't require mass uh, in this way. So uh, is, that a, is that a conspiracy against everyone? That I don't actually do politics myself? <laughs> um, that I can't pass any legislation? That I have to find a party that represents me? Um, or that I hope I can find a party that represents me? I don't know, but uh, it's a very small group of people in history that actually make history. Mm -hmm. um, but the main thing is the imagined community. We believe in those communities uh, and we're willing, if we're not willing to fight for them ourselves, we're willing to vote for politicians who, who will. I, I think the, the question is also getting at the role of power and the idea that political power is part of your answer, isn't it? Okay. Well, political power, it's what the great uh, German writer Clausewitz called war is a continuation of politics by, by other means. Um, no one quite knows. I mean, you, there are many translations of this word politik in, in German. It can mean policy. It can mean politics. Uh, Michael Howard, who was a notable translator of Clausewitz, actually said it could mean grand strategy. It doesn't really mean, matter what, what is politics? Politics is about power, yes. Um, the power to reward and the power to punish. Um, the power to reward your own followers and, 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 and punish people outside your own group. Uh, later it's become uh, with human rights, just as human rights have been redefined from the rights to the ultimate human right, from the right to uh, life, to the right to a self-fulfilled life. Uh, so politics has become about self-fulfillment and helping people with self-actualization to go back to that, uh, helping people lead more intense lives. Um, but war is in that sense very much a political act. 
the thing here I would say is that um, there are three ways of looking at the value to anything. So if we're looking at the uh, value of war, the first is, is intensely political, it's instrumental. So it is war as an active state, whatever the state may be, it could be a Greek city state, it could be a chiefdom, uh, hunter-gatherer societies first put together embryonic states called chiefdoms, and then of course the state which has been with us in some shape or form for 5,000 years and will continue to be with us for a little bit further. Earlier on it was empire. Empire was uh, one of the fundamental political organizations that we put together and empires were entirely based on war uh, and on pacification, constant pacification to keep the empire together, a kind of permanent state of war. That's the instrumental idea of war that has instrumental value. It makes you richer, it makes you more powerful, or I suppose the bottom line is it enables you to defend yourself against people that would otherwise seek something to, uh, to their advantage and not your own. But there are two other elements in the value. One is existential, and that is the warrior. That is people who do war who derive some value from it. And this is the very important point here, the difference between killing and dying. It is very difficult to persuade a human being to kill another human being. It is not at, in any way natural. It's even more difficult to persuade someone to die for another human being who is a member of the imagined community, but outside the kinship group or the bloodline. And yet we were able to do that in the 20th century. Millions were sent uh, to their deaths to die for uh, a cause, to die for a faith, frequently to die for each other, of course, soldiers, largely die for each other, uh, this community of fate which they find themselves. And this is Seb Younger's point, uh, or this, the thing that the soldier was trying to say to him, trust, you know, that level of trust in each other because you're protecting the, the person's back, which is pretty much unique to, I think, military life. But there's a third kind of value, absolute value, something which has value in itself. And very few societies have ever said war has value in itself. They said it's had value for making you rich, it's had value because it's noble. Uh, you go down dying, Churchill famously said in 1940, if this is the last great moment in British history, it will be a wonderful great moment. Historians will be writing about it. That's the existential element of war. I think only one group of people has ever said that war had absolute value, uh, and that was uh, the Nazis, who said that war is the natural uh, default mode of humanity and this struggle for life and this social Darwinian existence, this zero sum game. Uh, and um, it's, that is why it perished. It perished because it lived by war and died by war. Uh, for the communists, war was not an absolute value. It was a means to an end from time to time, but it was not an absolute value. For liberals, it is not an absolute value. It's a means to an end. I suppose for the Mongols, it was an absolute value, but they didn't quite see it in those value terms. There are warrior societies, of course, um, that are made up entirely of warriors in some shape or form for whom war is a form of life. But again, there again, would it be an absolute value? Would it be an absolute religious value? No, no religion has taught the absolute value of war. Uh, it's taught the necessity of war in certain circumstances, but it doesn't have any absolute value. And in that sense, peace does have absolute value. And this is why, to go back to Aristotle, and it's a very long-winded answer, so sorry, but I will end with Aristotle, my favorite thinker. Aristotle said the only purpose of war is peace. And that's absolutely true. I think every society in history has fought for peace. The problem has been their peace, peace on their terms, their idea of peace. And if you don't like their idea of peace, you will find yourself fighting against them to defend your own idea of what peace should be. Very few societies, the Nazi Germany being one of the few, ever said that the purpose of war is war. <laughs> okay, let's see. I have numerous questions. I'm going to try to put some together. Um, there's a variety of questions here. Uh, one from our friend of Ad Ideas, if it's the same, individual, Tom McCain, asking about uh, democratic peace. Uh, a number have asked about what about this um, mm. idea, big idea of the democratic peace. And another category of questions ask, what about substituting war with less uh, destructive things? For instance, could we ha not have Roman Colosseums again or 
war as sport, or another question was, could we privatize war? Could we substitute large scale collective violence for small scale games? And what about the democratic peace? Well, the idea, if I can answer the second uh, set of questions first, the idea of war, a uh, substitute for war um, ha has great appeal and it's quite old. Uh, one idea is that you just get mercenary armies fighting each other. So uh, these are people who uh, get paid to fight um, and they're happy to risk their lives, they're happy to die, presumably because the stakes are high uh, and the payoffs are great if they're lucky to survive. Um, this was suggested by Frank Barnaby when he was uh, running the Stockholm Institute for, for Peace back in the 1970s. Um, why not hire a battlefield in the Sahara Desert and get two armies of mercenaries slogging it out and you abide by the result. Another, of course, was why don't you do this on a computer like a video game? You could have a video game that lasted a year or two years. You could, or why not four years like the First World War? Play the whole of the First World War out on a video game and abide by the result. Or why not now get a group of robots fighting each other, uh, either virtually or in reality and abide by the result. The reason why you can't abide by the result is blood, bloodletting. That you will never accept defeat unless you've actually lost life. Um, this is really the, this is the, the title of Barbara Ehrenreich, the late Barbara Ehrenreich's book, Blood Rights, that basically war is, is about the shedding of blood. But blood in the way that we talk about bloodlines, aristocratic bloodlines, in which we talk about blood sacrifice, in which we talk about communities of blood, this means commu kinship communities. Blood has been a, a theme of human life from the very, very beginning, the most precious resource that we have to shed and take away from others. And it is very difficult to imagine two societies agreeing to abide by the result of a proxy war in this case. You can get your proxy fighters in the Cold War as a proxy war to a certain extent. The United States and the Soviet Union had their own in the case of the Soviet Union, national liberation uh, people fighting it out. In the case of the United States, perhaps uh, you had other groups. Did they abide by that result? Yes, they did, because it meant they didn't actually have to go to war against each other directly. Um, but that's a different factor altogether. The first question was uh, on the liberal idea, democratic peace. Democratic yeah. peace. Yes, well, of course, the crit critics of democracy <laughs> would say that uh, democratic countries are always at war with everyone else but not with each other. Uh, that if you come up with the Wilsonian idea, Woodrow Wilson's idea of making the world safe for democracy, then you basically, you're going to be at war the whole time because it will be a crusade and you'll be in the purpose of putting democratic regimes in power. And we know where that leads to because Thucydides wrote about it uh, in his history of the Peloponnesian War, where Athens supported democratic regimes imposed democratic regimes uh, on others after it had defeated some of its enemies, uh, where the Athenian Empire, the Delian League, as it was called, the League of Delos, had 23 members, only I think two of whom were not democracies. So it was basically the first democratic coalition of its kind. And if you look at the de great debates in the Athenian Assembly, which the Thucydides records so well, you will find that it's all about uh, living in a permanent peace which will be a democratic peace. But for that, you have to be permanently at war because most people don't want your democratic peace. That's the problem. Um, I don't know what your response, Aaron, will be to this because I know you've given these questions a great deal of thought, but many people would say there's something, uh, <laughs> you have to be very careful about the democratic peace uh, theory. Plus the fact uh, there have been cases where democracies have gone to war against each other. So what you need to do is to narrow it down and say liberal democracies don't go to war against each other, but illiberal democracies most certainly can go to war against each other. And what kind of democracies are you living in, a liberal or an illiberal one? Cases of an illiberal democracy might be uh, Yeltsin's Russia in the 1990s. Um, there are others that, that, that can come to mind. So you've got to be very careful about uh, definitions. But again, I would go back to the simple thing about economics. I don't think anything will prevent you from going to war if you find yourself constrained in particular circumstances. 
then you will decide and be able to put to the test this idea of whether um, democracies do or not. And by the way, um, I just say one other thing, uh, which I did in the book. If you, if you go back to the father of democratic peace theory, Immanuel Kant, and you're looking at uh, republics, as he called them, which some people choose to interpret as democracies, I think that's not entirely uh, accurate. But if you're going to this idea that republics in which people had to vote whether to go to war and would then have to fight for themselves. Kant was saying that such a world peace would be more likely than war. But what does he also say about war? That it does actually fulfill a function. He talks about a social sociability. He talks about how empire building, for example, brings you into contact with people other, very different from yourself, introduces you to other types of societies, produces a kind of cosmopolitanism uh, that wouldn't there wouldn't be operative, but for war, makes you less fearful of other people or suspicious of other societies. So he's talking there about um, how war can actually play an important part in building together your globalized world of trade, where in fact you don't need war any longer as the end result. So again, you've got to be very careful when you're going to cite Immanuel Kant. Uh, as the father of democratic peace theory, to think that he was a pacifist or he was against war. Uh, he wasn't, uh, actually. And in my book, I said, if you look at, uh, is there any scientific evidence for what Kant was putting forward as a metaphysical proposition? Well, there is the Flynn effect, which is the increase in IQ globally by three points. It doesn't sound much, but it's something which has been brought about partly by the intermingling of populations produced by refugee crises people fleeing wars. It's a strange way in which history delivers a result uh, indirectly. Um, so it's another, it's another case in which war may have adaptive value in the long term when you're looking back. On the transformation of war, we have a number of questions uh, I'll try to put together again. Um, at least two ask about the nuclear revolution. At least two ask about how nuclear weapons may have transformed war. And then a number ask about the culture of war, which you emphasize in your book. Um, do academics have a responsibility in this regard or are they complicit perhaps is the undertext of the question. And how do they, and another question asks, how do we reduce numbers of uh, recruitments? How do we re reduce those who wish to participate? Um, and then one, I think, is worth maybe for a second dwelling on. One question asks, could you expand on your definition of war or remind us perhaps uh, of the definition of war you're working with? For me, sometimes I think about the, the impressive species of the ants, of, of course, right? And so how is their war different? Is it the stories or is it, is it right? So I think those three questions go together. The ants can't transform war, can they? No. Um, okay, um, the question of um, the first question, I'm trying to remember what that Nuclear was. revolution. Nuclear revolution, yes. Yeah. Well, of course, when I was a, a student at university, we were told that nuclear weapons had abolished great power conflict. Uh, we'd finally invented a weapon that we couldn't use. Uh, the only purpose of, of, of military force was deterrence, to deter each other. Deterrence, of course was invented by the European powers at the end of the 19th century. They also had the same idea that the only purpose of having these great armies was to deter each other from going to war against uh, one another. Constantly undermined by arms races, which is also a factor, of course, of the Industrial Revolution uh, as well. Um, yes, uh, but the problem is, you see, we have found other ways of fighting war which were not available to the superpowers during the Cold War, cyberspace being one of them. Uh, uh, low Earth orbit uh, systems being another, um, knocking each other's satellites out or neutralizing each other's uh, satellites, blinding uh, each other. All of these things uh, are options for war, which the great powers, certainly Russia, China, and the United States are exploring. To explore something doesn't mean you will necessarily exploit it or wish to use it, but you will certainly wish to see what options are available. And the great thing, of course, I mean, the problem of cyberspace is that you can't deter anyone in cyberspace. There's no such thing as deterrence because you can be invisible. 
Uh, if you take the first cyber war between uh, Russia and Estonia in 2007, to this day, it's impossible to prove that Russia was behind the attacks that came from servers in 65 different countries. Um, this is the degree to which you can hide now, you, in which accountability becomes difficult, if not impossible. And there have been attempts to produce rules that would regulate conflict in cyberspace, and they've all failed. The United Nations brokered uh, talks between China and the United States in 2018 for the first time to try to get both powers to say what was acceptable and unacceptable in terms of using uh, cyber subversion, cyber espionage, cyber conflict, and those talks have broken down. So as far as we know, it's, it's, it's an open field out there. Um, my definition of war. Uh, well, I go, I, f I go back to what Nietzsche famously said, you can only define something which doesn't have a history. That anything which a history is going to defy uh, a single definition, because it will change uh, over time. In, if I'm talking about cyber warfare, it's very different from talking about the First World War. If I'm talking about well, the age of total war, it's very different from the Hundred Years' War in the Middle Ages between Britain and France. It is impossible to come up with an all-embracing definition of war. You can come up with a definition of Euclidean mathematics and geometrical proofs because they're unchanging. So I think uh, in a sense that that might be a rather historicist way uh, of looking at things and privileging history in this, but that's what I would do. Uh, but ultimately you can fall back on metaphors. And this is what Clausewitz does in his book. War is, 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 is an act of coercion to force someone to do one's will. War is a duel uh, between two protagonists. And remember that in a duel, you don't always kill the opponent when you've disarmed that opponent. It might even be dishonorable to kill the opponent who has been disarmed. It's all about honor and reputation and credibility again. It's not about the death of your opponents at all. And then of course, war is a wrestling match. So he used these sporting terms, uh, interestingly enough, to try to define war. And we're warned by scientists that metaphors are not helpful in science and hard science. But of course, in the humanities, metaphors are what we do. And we are a metaphorical species, to go back to that word I've overused. We are a species that uses metaphors to make colorful and, and, and to throw and illuminate things that might otherwise not be so uh, illuminating, but for their, but for their use. Good. The last two minutes, let's have the last question on the role of academics in the culture of war and how do we reduce the number of, how do we change our war culture? There's that classic essay in war culture. I guess these are types of questions. There's a number of other excellent questions, but we're running out of time. We'll end on that question if that's okay. Yes, uh, the, well, <laughs> the role of academics. What is an academic? Um, should you think about war at all? Of course you have to think about war. Uh, you, what you're doing by thinking about war is what we're doing when we do history, which is looking at patterns in history, just as we look at weather patterns uh, in, able to in, a, in order to predict what's coming next. So when you go back to the first Chinese uh, philosopher of war that we know, uh, Sun Tzu, whether he existed or not doesn't really matter, immensely important, or whether we're looking at Machiavelli's art of war that was taught in military academies before Clausewitz's book, uh, saw the light of day, whether we are looking uh, at any of the philosophers of war, what they were all trying to do, I think, was to find patterns that would enable you to be more successful if you found yourself in war. But also, I think, ultimately, and I wrote a book about this called Barbarous Philosophers, to regulate war, to mitigate its evils, uh, to uh, limit the damage it actually produced. Uh, and that, of course, is the most important, well, I'll end on this note because I know that two minutes is up, the most important single uh, contribution that Klaus Fitz made by saying that war has a tendency to escalate and to escape from political control. They were all very, very keen on controlling war. Long before we came out with nuclear weapons and long before we started mobilizing millions of people in the field, people were very anxious to keep politicians in control of the process. And that is the greatest danger of war, that it will escalate uh, as it did in the First World War and it has done in, in many wars 
Is that a value for academics? Yes, I think academics perform a useful role, but um, they can't save us from the evil consequences uh, of war, unfortunately. Terrific, okay. Thank you everyone for all your questions and thank you, Christopher, for all your thoughtful answers. That was a really, uh, really deep and uh, fascinating discussion of this book, which I believe is now available, right? I believe it is. And there was one question yes. about digital copies. Are these available? I believe soon. Um, perhaps there's other announcements from, from others on the team, but I think that's it for the present time. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us and, and giving us these excellent questions. And thanks again, Christopher. Thank you. And pick up the book. Bye.